We wear the mask that grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. This debt we pay to human guile. With torn and bleeding hearts we smile. And moth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Nay, let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but, O oh, great Christ, our cries to thee from tortured souls arise. We sing, but, O oh, the clay is bowed beneath our feet and long the mile. But let the world dream otherwise. We wear the mask. This week on Home Again TV, we will learn how one local Negro artist set the stage for new visual artists to emerge in Columbus. We will also sit down and speak with two visual artists today that provide a unique way to art for the future of the 614. Stay tuned. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Home Again TV. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Gaga. Hey, Darlene Matthews. Thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you. Hey, Lavana. Lavana, can you do me a favor? Can you hit that share button in the left hand corner? It's free. This will go out to all of your friends, letting them know that you're watching the show. And this is how the community grows. Uh, when your friends know, they can share with their friends. That's what's good about Facebook. Hey, Sadea, I still am waiting for my meal. <laughs> no, I know you're busy and I'm so proud of you. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Devante, thanks for joining me today. I'm trying to learn to relax in the beginning of my show uh, so that I can acknowledge you guys, understand who's watching. We can be, begin to dialogue and create a conversation. I think that's important when you're uh, going live is to create that reality of who is on the other line uh, so that we can have a conversation. Today we are talking about art history. And art history is nothing unique. Uh, we all are familiar with it. But art history is unique to o uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, when it pertains to being an African American. Uh, as you saw in the clip, we talked about Elliot Henderson. And he actually was a individual that was responsible for creating poetry. Um, he also was a, a published author of nine volumes of poetry. Um, as well as a professor. And this was in the mid to late 1800s. So African Americans have played a huge role when it pertains to the arts in Columbus, Ohio. We have two great artists uh, that are with us in the studio today who are making an impact on what it means to create art today. Uh, as we know in the past, there was visual artists that was popular in things like um, uh, ceramics. Uh, there was visual artists were popular doing uh, pottery. Uh, but as time changes, there becomes new visual artists that, or I shouldn't say art, artist, but art that enters into society. And I'm so excited to have these two players share with us so that you guys learn a new resource. Um, this is huge when black people learn to become better. And I hope that we are providing you with a unique, unique resource so that you can continue to grow. And as you grow, you will know to share with your family and friends. That's what it's all about. My first guest, I'm so excited today, is for you guys, I know many of you already know, her name is Stephanie Bridges. Uh, she's an author. Uh, she is an advocate for writers. 
Uh, and she also has a book club that we want to go and dig deeper in and learning more about so that you guys know, if you know of someone who's a writer or who is interested in learning to become a writer, you can use her as a resource. We're going to watch a clip for a minute and we'll be back. And when we return, I'll be with Stephanie Bridges. See you in a second. What is Negro poetry? What is true of the melodies of the Negro as developed in the simple existence on the plantation is also true of the other form of singing or verse making. Among the Negroes that have sprung up a number of exponents of the wisdom, wit, and humor of the race, they have caught the spirit of others, the humble philosophers of their kind, and they have employed the dialect to reproduce the thought in all its originality. Two of the most notable of these exponents or interpreters is Ohio Negroes, one being Paul Lawrence Dunbar and the other being Columbus's own Professor Elliot Blaine Henderson, who is also the writer and the collector of nine volumes of poetry. So as you can see, uh, the arts is nothing new to the city of Columbus. Um, but it's always evolving. Is that, is, would you yes, say that that's definitely. true? I definitely agree. Okay, thank you for joining <laughs> me, Steph. I'm so excited to be here on Home Again <laughs> with Rita Fuller Yates. Yes, doing it for the middle school champion. <laughs> <laughs> what she's saying is, we went to middle school together. Yes. We went to champion together. We sure did. So we have some history. Uh, I saw you, I've, I've watched you evolve into this fabulous artist. Uh, you were always unique. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. No, you were always intelligent. And I think you always was uh, some form of a writer. Yeah. Do you remember that being a part of your lifestyle as a young person? Definitely, definitely. So before Champion, when I was in elementary school, actually, I recall um, our teacher going around and telling everybody what they should become. And at that time, you know, if your teacher said it, then, you know, that it was gold. It. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm going to do then. So um, my teacher said that I should be a newscaster or I should be a writer. And so I am definitely an introvert. And I was like, I'm not coming on anybody's six o'clock news. That was the only news that we, you know, you watched it in the evening. And that was on. Yeah, she's on TV every day. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, it goes full God. circle. I was like, oh, well, I'll be a writer because I'll just be able to be by myself. And I won't have to go out and interact. And then I was writing and I was publishing books. And I was like, oh, maybe I need to go out and tell people. <laughs> So here I am. Yeah, it's not very successful not selling it. I mean, it's exactly. pretty cool to write on yourself for a hobby. But what makes a successful author yes. is the sales. Is that correct? No, that's 100% true. So okay. as you mentioned, I do have a book club. It is the Bridges Book Club. I wish my group Bridges was here. Book Club! <laughs> So, um, and we are, we do that. We support one another as authors. It is an author-led group versus a reader-led group. And our mission is to gain knowledge, give back, and grow literary legacies. And woo! Woo! Say it again. Oh, okay. Legacy. Well, hold up. Legacy. Legacy. Oh. Say it again. Girl, oh. that is huge. Because... What does it look like for someone younger to look at you doing something like writing a book? Right. And, and that is very important because sometimes we, we definitely want to make those monetary gains. And that is part of what we do. But also we need to understand the legacy, mm -hmm. the historical meaning of writing and publishing books and our stories. When um, our ancestors weren't able to do that for centuries. So it is so important that we share our stories. And I often tell people, you know, you might write something, it might hurt the people closest to you and free someone you will never have the opportunity to meet. But 
in order to release and break some of those um, chains, we need to definitely put it out there and let other people see. So that is something that will always be. I wrote four uh, books, one about each of my children. And part of that was because wanting to to talk about them and telling about them, but also wanting to provide them something, give them something. So I might not, you know, be able to buy the computers or the, the Game Boys or, you know, the, the clothes and the Jordans and different things like that, but providing my children something that will last for an intern. This eternity. This is a lifetime. Yeah, stuff. a lifetime. Then, yeah, they're children's 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 children. Girl, when I yeah. tell you, when I tell you that um, that's so big for me, you know, mm -hmm. my business is named after my daughter. Yes. So I thought, I always thought mm -hmm. when she was probably two, I thought about Wendy's. Mm hmm. And because, you know, again, being African American is so different. Yes. That was just dreams. Mm -hmm. Because I never knew anybody who had a business that named anything off their kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, to have a business was pretty cool anyway when right. we were growing Definitely. up. But to name it after your kid is so precious. So that's <laughs> something that is a memory, I think, every time they say it, as mm -hmm. they get older. It's going to strike a sense of confidence yes. that I think is going to be unbelievable for them. I don't care when you, they can be mad as I don't know what about you. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they think about my mama wrote a book about me. Yes. I mean, that confidence <laughs> has to be amazing. And how many times are they going to tell their friends that they, as they grow older? As they grow older. As they grow exactly. older. As they grow older. <laughs> as they grow older. I mean, that's pretty cool. Definitely. And I think, I mean, that's definitely true. As they grow older, they'll be able to appreciate it more. Um, I'm a new grandma, so I'm definitely going to be writing a book about my grandbaby. But um, my son will be able to share his book with her. And so it's, if you ask anybody in the family, they're like, oh, you got them spot on, you got them spot on. But it's sometimes difficult as a young person to be like, oh, well, I, I don't need the, the attention that much. I don't always need to be the center of attention. Well, kind of. So, well, I so, think that's what they say then. Mm -hmm. But as they get older, they appreciate it. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely I, think, so. I think it's huge mm -hmm. to be an example for the legacy because mm -hmm. a lot of where we came from legacy was discussed but it was hard for them to create a position yes so I yeah know it, it was hard and, and to hold was, on to that because yeah. there was so much going against that even if you did um build something up i mean even recently uh just uh taking the um the, the dollars out of the black community as far as real estate is concerned. I mean, that was exactly. what, what in the 90s. I mean, they were doing that in the 90s. So even when we work so hard and build and, you know, do all those things and get them bootstraps out, like, you know, we're supposed to, sometimes it is a little bit more difficult for us. So. Well, that's why we have to have the conversation set, uh, mm -hmm. step and we have to have and let people know uh, about you um, for those that don't because you are creating a new process so that we can evolve in ourselves. Definitely. Um, you're not talking about stage work. Mm -hmm. You're talking about you work. Mm. You're sitting down creating the better you, which ultimately ends up maybe on the stage. Mm -hmm. But it starts with learning who you are. And as writers, yes, it seems that someone has a passion for writing. They know that they, they are supposed to uh, birth a book? Mm -hmm. Are those the individuals that should be coming to the Stephanie's or the Bridges Book Club? Or is it people that's already written a book? Yes, yeah, so it's the Bridges Book Club. We're on Facebook. We have a public group, so you can join us there. And then there's BridgesBookClub.com if you're considering joining as an author. And we have aspiring authors. We have published authors. We have best-selling authors. So, yes, if you feel like, yeah, there's a story I need to tell, but even if you're not a writer, because there are ghost writers, there's voice to text, um, so sometimes you have a story and you don't know how to go about and get it out. And that's great uh, at the Bridges Book Club because we do. We have, as I said, ghost writers. We have editors. We have publishers. We have people that can assist you so that it's not something that you, you're like, oh, I can never You even do have this. somebody that 
transitions the book to a movie. Yes. So actually, um, Danielle D. Smith, mm -hmm. she um, created a movie from her book, Yesterday's Tomorrow. And she also has the movement, Don't Be Quiet. And that's the name of her film. So one of the things I was telling you before we got on camera is that we support one another. So her film was in a film festival that another one of the Bridges Book Club members holds every year and her name is Sherry Brooks. So we all traveled to Detroit. There are about four or five of us and we hung out. We got to watch um, Danielle's film and then also Colette Harrell. She had her book entered for an award um, for the, it, she actually won the award for best book to film, you know, being ready to turn into a film. So we get excited about- um, That's good though. That's yeah, so isn't that good. wonderful? Well, it's, it's huge because again, we are every, you're everyday people. Yes, we definitely- And this is what, you know, again, I'm talking about me wanting and inspiring as a young black girl to be mm -hmm. better, but not having a lot of examples around us. But what you're almost saying is, it doesn't matter. You don't need to be a movie star in anything. Mm -hmm. If you have the desire and the passion to do something, just do it. Mm -hmm. And there are local resources for everybody to do what their passion is. Well, and you are one of them. Yes, we are here. And I, I do want to mention... Um, How one, often do you meet? So we meet monthly. We do have the Bridges Author Mastermind Group. And we meet at Daymar College. Okay. Um, so you are more than welcome to come out there. It is an event. You can find it on uh, Facebook. And you can also uh, zoom in. So if you're not able to come to the actual location, like if you're in another city or you're, you know, commuting during that time, you can actually zoom in as well and meet with us. Love time. it. Again, we have Stephanie Bridges in the Bridges Book Club as a new resource Woo! for the city of Columbus. We don't take her work in vain. We want to support her. So as she said, her website is bridgesbookclub.com. And she also has a Facebook page, which is Stephanie R. Bridges. And we also have the Bridges Book Club group. So she'll be looking forward to getting you guys' friend request. We are going to take a transition break. And we have some sponsors to acknowledge. We'll be back in about 30 seconds. Today's episode is brought to you by Vision Realty. Log on to www.realty.com and contact Don Payne for all of your real estate needs. Also brought to you by Politically Savvy, a new political talk show hosted by Gail Dudley. Coming to Home Again TV in January 2020. mom's my best friend What's that? hello did you guys uh, enjoy our sponsors uh, vision realty with Don Payne and of course uh, Chapel of Peace uh, with my guy Marlon Gary I thought uh, that was it but my husband said no that wasn't the sponsor <laughs> <laughs> it probably all oh, politically savvy with Gail Dudley that's our new show starting in 2020. We will take on um, two new, two or three, we're taking on new two, two or three partners and we're helping them produce their own show on Home Again TV. Yeah, so we're trying to be a resource so that people can, when they're trying to find a great artist, they can just come to our page and either look at your stuff from the video or look at an event that I attended with you um, so that we can constantly grow. That's awesome. We trying, Richard. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, this is my new friend, Richard Duarte Brown. I told my brother, my, my husband, his name is Duarte. He said it's Dwart. <laughs> I said, I don't know. That sounds, that don't sound right. Duarte sounds cooler. Yes. And it's right, Duarte. It's Portuguese name. Oh, you told us your story. I got to meet, I had the honor of meeting Mr. Uh, Richard. Actually, I feel like I already know Richard because he's affiliated through Dante. Uh, but, or I should say, Dante is affiliated through you. <laughs> but I met you last week during the history in arts, is what I like to call it, um, at Bexley Library. 
And you told your story a little bit about uh, not being from Columbus, but being here early enough to be a part of the art world at a very evolving time, I think. During the 70s. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the people that you met that <clears throat> we're familiar with okay. that made an impact on your... So when I got here, I had a brother named Darnell Harris who was attending CCAD. Mm -hmm. I came to live with him, and I would be in middle high school. Mohawk was the school at the time, which is Afrocentric now. And um, Elijah Pierce had a gallery right around on, on uh, Long Street um, where Columbus State is now. Um, Amina used to come in Cherry H. Cole's art supply store. She was she was Brenda then. And Adrian Horde and some of these people, um, I got to hang around just like everyday people. It wasn't like they were such big artists, you know. And um, and I got to meet a, a guy named Smokey Brown. We called him Grandpa Smokey. And the gallery, the Ace Gallery was here. Um, William H. Thomas Gallery, of course. Uh, the Frank Hale Black Cultural Center. Kojo and his wives. He said <laughs> say wives because Dr. Marion Anderson was his first wife. And she goes way back with Roman Johnson and um, some of these people I that... I saw Roman Johnson. <laughs> I just saw some work of his. Yeah. Um, it was very, very like uh, special to me. I felt like I found a family, you know, in a sense of the artist. I saw myself as an artist at an early age, and um, it was the way I communicated. So hanging around the people, I just felt those were people that I started just like documenting or keeping pictures of. And my idea was they said I would never make money. My mom and them was trying to discourage me from going mm -hmm. to art school. Mm -hmm. Said I would never make money as an artist. I had to go to new, live in New York. And somehow I had an attitude that New York would have to come to me. And um, the more they say I should be an artist, it drove me to it more. So it was kind of, it was more about finding a way to express myself. So I thought right away I would learn screen printing, documenting, hanging around CCAD. Dean Consani knew who I was. There was a Pace Gallery on the east side where I actually met this lady named Louise Nelson. So Barbara Shavas. I, she used to live in places mm -hmm. down. She built her totems before then. She had dementia. I used to think she didn't like me um, <laughs> because she would forget who I was every time I saw her at one point. And I, I, I noticed she did everybody the same way. And I, I uh, began to realize she had, um, I think, maybe dementia. There's a girl named Yolanda Brown that was a friend of hers. She taught it around. Um, and some of the people are still here. Um, but um, Linda Willis was one of the people at Ace Gallery. Um, like So I'm just randomly naming names. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I think one of the things that I like to talk about, especially during the 70s era and before, when it pertains to being an African American in the arts, it wasn't very popular for our parents mm -hmm. to support like it is today. Right. I mean, it seems like parents understand you can make money in photography, and I think social media has helped with that. A lot. What is it that you think our parents were trying to do discouraging us to being in being artists. Well, well, I think they knew about this file 13 where when you were a black person, you applied for something, there was a file 13 made for you. You can fill out the application. You can be told you're going to be treated right, but stuff went in file 13. It disappeared as the trash can, basically. <laughs> and when you entered art shows, if stuff looked too ethnic, if it wasn't more than 1%, I mean, I'm saying 1%, there's a thing that was around there. Some, some places only took 1% art, ethnic art, which means Asian, African, and you know any anything that wasn't European, so mm -hmm. it was only one percent included into these festivals and stuff. So you you didn't know this, but you felt this. So you would try to make your art look European to get in and sell. Mm. Maybe I mean it was these notions to do that. Mm. So I look back, um, entering some of the fairs and things, doing those kind of things. And I talked to some some people now. They say I would have never done that. Well, if you've never been in a position where you've had to apologize for your race or apologize for not being something else. You've never been in that position, and it's kind of hard for somebody to really understand, you know. And then on top of that, um, you know, you're fighting this battle where you, you know, you have to be degreed, and then you get around degreed people who make you feel like, well, you don't have a PhD, so you're really not going to ever amount to much. So it was like this thing where I, the more they said what I could, what I, what I wasn't going to do or couldn't do, I found myself doing it more, and um, and I and I learned the the ability to paint from my spirit rather than my intellect, and I learned how to take rejection. I'll give you a good example. One, one of my paintings was um, accepted into the Ohio State Fair way back when the Mid-Ohio Mid -Ohio Planning Commission was still around Franklin University on Main Street. And um, <clears throat> a guy named Ben Crumpler, he had a show there. He's another mm -hmm. part of piece mm -hmm. of history. He's still alive, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. But um, I put this thing called Juggler. I framed it really well, submitted it. 
but our, our show was rejected. Turned around, was invited to bring work to the Mid-Ohio Planning Commission. Well, it was hung on the wall at Art in the Halls, and it was one of like the first pieces I sold that, that was just rejected from somewhere else, but it was brought by a collector, which I had to learn how to put that in perspective and realize that when the jury shows, it's all this art coming in, people just walking by like they're at a, you know, an auction or something, and they're just fanning through stuff, and it's very subjective. It's not always like, but I'm just saying that that, that life is, if you're, not ready to, if you're not ready to face rejection or deal with it or, you know, with, even like publishing these books, you're gonna you're gonna face rejection. And well, that's being an artist. Yeah, or I mean that is sort of the the courage. Yeah, to become an artist is everyone's not gonna like it. Right. Because it is art is subjective. Yeah, very. Um, I mean, being an interior designer, I mean everything, and that's what we're talking about when we're we're now exposing visual arts. Even as African Americans, I think a lot of times we think art is what almost what you do, or if it's. Uh, wrapped in materials or something that is created in that sense. We now know that that's not true. You right. know, visual arts are huge. And we can infuse and identify ways to impart ourselves in it if we feel more encouraged in it, if we know more about it, even digitally. Um, that's become popular now. Yes. Maybe a person like myself, I didn't major in interior design as a minor I meant uh, with my bachelor's because I couldn't draw <laughs> and in the 80s if you wanted to be any form of an artist you had to have that ability but I went back and got my master's in it because at that point it was digital so uh, mm -hmm. if you knew a little bit of CAD if you knew some measurements and understood some basic skills you could be successful at it now yeah. but 20 years ago that wasn't the case so different well, one of the things that I thought, one of the stories that you told that I thought is so interesting, and I wish we had dropped in the video, mm -hmm. um, and maybe you can share that on your page and I'll share it. Uh, but when you went and visited with uh, Smokey's uh, wife, a uh, widow wife, yeah. right? Yes. He had passed. Uh, uh, can you tell the audience what, um, what took place that day when you okay. went to her um, home? Smokey passed in 2005. Smokey Brown was like a father figure, grandfather figure, and it's smelt, spelt S-M-O-K-Y, not an E in there. His name is actually Russell Purse, and he used to be an, a person that recovered from alcoholic uh, alcoholism, and he and he, uh, he announced that uh, Russell Purse is dead, Smokey Brown's alive. Well, 15 years have gone by. We haven't heard from Laverne. Um, she gives me a call, and she says, hey, Ricky, this is Laverne, because she has another name she goes by on Facebook. Look, <laughs> and uh, we get to go to her house and she gives me this little bag of pictures because um, it's like this is this is me a boy without a father technically a bastard you know getting an inheritance which is unreal and when I say this it has a very personal meaning because he was like a family member which for 15 years there was no word from his mom his wife and um, we get to, I get to go see her I took Dante about Bobby because he's been documenting all my special moments like that. Mm -hmm. And I knew this was history because I felt like everything needs to be saved. Because if we don't tell these stories, they're just not there. So we go to her house and she gives me these paintings. You know, you know, I'm teared up and she's talking and she was telling me Smokey would want me to have it. And she was saying she gives me all rights and everything. And it was just really still kind of hard to process. Then she takes me to the basement. She says, oh, there's more. And we go in the basement. And then she has work of... Uh, I mean, a Robinson. Um. That was the aha moment for me. Now, of course, I saw when y'all was going in the basement, I assumed y'all was going to go look at some art. Yeah. But when she pulled that one out from behind the fabric, <laughs> and it was work from Amina Robinson, and you were like, I get that too? And she was like, yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. I mean, we hear inheritance, you automatically think money. I yeah. mean, I know I may. Right, right. <laughs> but you were just as excited. Yes. For the art, the inheritance of art. <laughs> yeah. With you being it's, an it's artist. Very, I go back to those moments. Now, this is what's really weird about that. Amina's last sub show that I got to hang with her, she was in, in Bexley at the um, Hammond Hawkins Gallery. And Dante was there meeting her for the very first time. So he had no idea who I was taking him to. And so in her last show, we were, she said, I said I was trying to put my life in order so my son can walk into my art. And, and this legacy that we leave, that he understands what it is. And little did I know, this this whole year has been a year of getting everything on shelves, getting everything documented, 
get everything acclimated and just set it up. I was doing it for myself, not knowing that I was going to do it for even Grandpa Smokey, so this, this legacy would be doubled because my son's going to take on this stuff and he understands the value of it. He knows what it really means. And the other thing is, what's great about this, though the museum has acquired Amina's, well, you know, house and everything, we only can go in through their auspices. Mm -hmm. There's not many black spaces where we can go and just be black without apologizing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that in a way to disregard white people no. or other races. No. But what do you got to go through the filter of the Columbus Museum, Hammond Hawkins, to get to Amina when we can just talk to each other like people, like the Blackberry Patch and things like that. There's some kind of like, like, barrier between the the reality to touch it when they want to bring it out so laverne's big thing was she didn't want to just put this in some place that will put it in a basement and you know put it in archives and bring it out whenever they felt like it according to whoever they would she said she knew that smokey would be proud and i know what to do with it and i'm just like kind of blown away by that see but that's huge because it doesn't stop no it doesn't it's always evolving um <laughs> into the next generation um i think that's what really makes art um, as we probably already are aware, I don't know if that's always uh, the best way to say it, but once people do surpass <laughs> onto the next realm, it does become a lot more popular. And me and my husband talked about this because he had to almost tell me it didn't really have anything to do with them waiting until the art, until the person is no longer here. But his philosophy was that it's now very rare. Much more rare. Because yes. they will no longer ever make that. Well, what, what, what really surprised me, on a trip back to Laverne, they just happened to be opening the show at a, at a place in the city. Mm -hmm. And um, and I showed her a picture. She said, that's not Smokies, that's not Smokies. <gasps> and she discovered that there's there's counterfeit Smokies that she can oh, show me. Oh, already? And he knew about it before he passed. There were counterfeit Smokies. And, you know, it's not to put scars on anybody, but they don't yeah, know. But but I got the source know. of the life. And she's going to show me what's counterfeit and what's not. So you will again be representing that conversation today. So <laughs> that when the artists or what are they called? The people who grade art. Yeah. When they're trying to better understand his work, you yeah. can represent that conversation. That's Is right. That I true? mean, tr truthfully, technically, you know, I, we did a book called Hey, Making Art with Grandpa Smokey Through My Son. And um, we also did something on a Blackberry Patch, a coloring book with champion middle school with me and I, I saw that and, and I, I loved it so I meant to talk about that with you <laughs> but ironically, it was just it was moments when you work with another artist since I was there I, I was going to make things happen because I knew that me and this girl Shelby I cared about mm -hmm. documenting the east side and it's just all these little things that you just you know it's important so you get these rare opportunities to take a minute and and make it in a way that can be if, if it means volunteer you're you're planning to see for the future in, in a good way that articulates some of our history. Well, I'm always excited to sit down and you could probably tell me at least 50 other stories. I was so engaged in your life and how uh, authentic you were. You shared things about your, your dad um, and I thought that was awesome, learning who your dad was, that whole journey. Because I think, again, as African-Americans, our strife is what makes us sometimes very creative. Yeah, there's my, oh, have... there's our book. Look at there. This was um, illustrated by you. And one of, the, uh, one of the kids. So all along the way, I've always had a, a young boy, a black boy that, uh -huh. would, that would be my like um, uh, assistant or mentor. Malik Carrington is that with me, um, and he's he's listed in there. And it was just to give him another uh, chance to kind of know what we do. He's he was there and met Laverne. He was there when um, she found, told us about some of those are off are not Smokies. Those are those are fake counterfeits. And uh, he was there blown away. <laughs> I love it. So, so you take, I have a slew of sons and, and daughters around. Like it's been, it's been my 30 year journey to um, work in and out of centers where young people were. And most of my, my focus is was instilling them a trade, a uh, way to, you know, make it. It was people that may, may not have had an opportunity maybe. And I don't like to say troubled youth, but it, were, it was this opportunity to always give someone insight on what I was doing. Just like oh, the Smokey okay. did and other artists did. And, I got the chance to walk in Elijah Pierce's shop and touch things and feel awkward, not knowing what it's like to be around a grandfather or a father. But it was a very like, he said, be careful with that. I remember that be careful thing and I how he looked. <laughs> so I, I came home and told him that that was what you had I, said, I, but so, we would expect for him to be that well, way. I just, I keep looking through all the things that I've been saving and saving in every different box. Now they're finally coming together. And I found a piece of Valentine's. He has an original photo he took of Elijah Pierce that I have, but he is. 
and he's sitting there with his stuff, and it's just said God is love on it. And it was always like, uh, these are drawings that I've, do I've done, but they have not been brought into a place where you can see them. So the show I'm going to be doing re coming up at, at Streetlight is going to be in January, and it's going to it's going to be called the East Side Canon. It's a canon of artists that we put in our own canon. We're not waiting to be in, you know, the history's canon, but we are part of history. And um, I'm going to tell some from my perspective of artists that were around when I was around and how they influenced me. And um, and I think that when you tell those stories, we're, we're people of oral tradition. I think we've failed in the sense of not, not being documentators like I learned from a Somalian artist who said, we don't document, we don't, we don't write it down. We tell stories and they get mixed up and lost. So we have to work hard at documenting some things. And, um, you know, and I've learned that's important. You and know. being great listeners. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I mean, so. that's that's always seems to be when grandma's talking. <laughs> uh, and it was just always that one person that just happened to listen. I have a little sister, Ivy Brown, Butterball, we call her, but she will kill me for saying that name, but I can't help Butterball. her. Butterball. <laughs> <laughs> little Butter, little sister. She's my baby sister. Um, and uh, she kept all pictures. And for a while, I was, not, I was here in Ohio trying to, get rich and buy happiness to fix my family. Uh, little did I know that I'm not the hero or superhero, but um, the big thing is knowing who your family is and knowing who you are and knowing where you come from or just getting a little bit of it. And I think even today, there's not a, it, when, I, when I work around kids, the big thing is sitting down and have, having talks. Like, I'll give you an example of an easy way to break up a fight. When I say break up a fight, one of the kids comes in and he says, I'm going to F this dude up, Alex. Or, you know, I don't, I'm not going to say names. But, uh, and then he, he looks at me because I'm older now. And I can mm -hmm. speak from another place. So I said, after you do that, then what? And he looks at me because he expects me to say, don't do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's almost like, don't let nothing surprise you at this point. Mm -hmm. What can really surprise you? Oh, and then uh, we had this talk about, you know, he said, well, he did this. I said, everybody does dumb stuff, you know, and you know, you have, your father has, and everybody has. And I said, at some point, you, you know, I don't, I forgot, but I'm, at this point, it was just, it was the fact that he didn't expect me to react like that. I didn't expect me to react like that, but. I've kind of learned along the way that it's almost good to just, before you respond, just strategize by thinking. And if you're angry and you're puffed up you or just upset, you really can't strategize. And so, so it is with making art. The whole, the whole thing in this art is a strategy to make sense out of my life and to connect to the past and leave stuff for the future. Well, you've done a good job mm -hmm. at it, being an example for the 614. You now are a part of Legacy where you're basically telling, representing the story from the people who are no longer here because God positioned you at a good time. And look what you're doing now. You're like, almost like uncle. <laughs> you're well, the it, uncle. Yeah, actually, if you, they've got to creative control these new groups in. They all call me Uncle Ricky. So oh, See, I just made that up. But you, that's you, how you, I see you yeah, in the arts. So if you hear that, that name, that's who I am. It's Richard Dewar Brown, but my family call me Ricky. Uncle Ricky. Uncle Ricky. Can yeah. I call you, you Uncle, call Ricky? Me Uncle Ricky? That's so much easier than Duarte. <laughs> so that's why Grandpa Smokey was so easy. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, where were you now? For now on, or Uncle Ricky? <laughs> to many of our artists, us <laughs> artists, and I'll be shaved to honor. share that. Um, did, can you tell everybody how they can contact you if they're <clears throat> interested in learning more about you? My website is the Arts Collective Group. Um, that's D U A R T E S collective group dot uh, dot com I mean I think so <laughs> I'm on, I'm on we'll Facebook share. as Richard Duart Brown my Duart is D-U-A-R-T-E and I'm on um, Instagram as Art with Duart and do y'all have a date yet for that January event um, it's not it's not a, I'm, I'm not sure what date but it's gonna be, it has to go up before Christmas Somewhere it's going to be set up January, beginning of January. And this is at the Streetlight Guild. The Streetlight Guild, um, which is Scott Woods, Scott Woods Scott which was okay. established in 2017. We love Scott. 100 years later after Harlem Renaissance. Isn't that something? <laughs> hey, you know what? At least we got there. We ain't even going to talk about that. <laughs> at least we got there. And thank God for the people who uh, stayed positioned to make it happen. Uh, you joined us for another episode of Home Again TV. We had two fabulous artists that can be a good resource for you and your family for uh, maybe an inspiring artist, rather it be a book club or you're learning to become a better artist. Uh, we have resources for you. Nothing that we do is in vain. Everything we do is to help the community grow and become better. I am your lifestyle expert, Rita Fuller Yates. 
and I'll see you next time.